I've always regarded myself as somebody who does the job for a living, primarily, but I, I'm not content. I don't think any writer is content with what he's done. I think the whole business of writing is so difficult that one hopes that one can someday write a good book. Uh, I, I say that uh, uh, with total sincerity. Uh, I think we are so aware of the faults in every book we write, the faults which spring from ourselves rather than from defective technique, that one hopes someday to present a better self in the book one produces. Uh, in England, of course, one is always told that, you know, one writes too much, but I think we're, we're sort of a subject to the influence of people like E.M. Forster, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot, who wrote so little. Yeah. Are there faults in the last book? Oh, yes, but I won't point them out. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that to the critics. Uh, one breathes a kind of sigh of relief when uh, uh, the critics have not noticed a sticky patch and indeed sometimes praise the sticky, patch, uh, sticky patches, uh, you know, eminently well done. Uh, no, uh, I'm well aware of the faults of the novel, but uh, this is true of every book I write. Do you care about the critics? Unfortunately, I do. One never gets over that. I think even uh, Somerset Maugham at the age of 91 uh, could be hurt, and uh, I'm especially hurt by a, a particular review, which I won't specify, uh, in a particular paper for which I write, which seems to me to be a personal attack rather than uh, an assessment of the book itself. That does hurt a great deal. Do you... Do you, do you hesitate to pick them up, or do you turn to it straight away? When, when no, it... I think, uh, I'll leave that to my wife. I think uh, wives have certain functions. That's one of them, to look at the reviews first and say, she, my wife was Italian, says to me, Antonio, don't read that. But then you I do won't. read it. One is led to it eventually, probably a, a year later or something like that. But uh, when the book is fire hot, fire new, when the reviews come out, one is somewhat hesitant about this. Uh, yes, uh, I've read a lot of reviews, you know, produced in the past, say, 20 years. I'm not hurt any longer, but I sometimes feel that uh, there's more personal enmity in reviews in this country than people, imagine, than people really know. You write under the name of Anthony Burgess, yeah. but it, it's not your only name, or even in a sense your real name. No. In your autobiography, we meet a young fellow called Jackie Wilson, yes. who is uncertain of his future. Mm -hmm. Is he still around? He's still around. The full name is John Anthony Burgess Wilson, and... Uh, there's a very simple reason for adopting the middle names uh, for writing, is there? I was in the colonial civil service in Malaya, and now Malaysia, I believe, and uh, in general, one was not supposed to produce uh, anything light-hearted, uh, such as fiction, under one's own name. One was in a serious job. You could produce a, a monograph on uh, local dialects or something like that, but you couldn't produce a novel. So I chose the two middle segments of the name and uh, more or less stuck with them. I answer to any name you like, but sometimes Jack, sometimes John, but uh, more often than not, my wife calls me Antonio. That's my name. But if uh, Jack Wilson is still inside you, as he must mm -hmm. be, I mean, it's he who's, who's taking this... I'm not absolutely sure I'm this great... Yes, I think, I think it's not in there. Uh, yeah, I, I quite accept that. Uh, we always have a problem uh, of identity... Uh, the Jack Wilson comes back occasionally. I was in Manchester last year and I was signing a few books in a bookshop and uh, an ancient man came along and said, I'm your nephew. And uh, another man, equally ancient, said, I've married your niece. And uh, various people I did not recognise who were very ancient indeed called me Jack. Uh, but the, the real Jack callers are nearly all dead, alas. You, you have happy memories of Manchester in your childhood? Uh, I suppose uh, it, is, it is my town. Uh, one never really gets us over this kind of local patriotism. Uh, we had a... I, th I think everybody has a rough time. Had a rough time, certainly in the 1920s, 1930s. A pretty bad time for everybody. Uh, I think what really uh, was the problem in Manchester was, the, uh, was this divisiveness. I, I think being a member of a Catholic family, living in a Protestant city, uh, the first thing I ever learnt about was uh, this divisiveness and uh, indeed this bigotry which of course still goes on two ways it went, it, i think it, uh, it went one way because um, the protestant majority was uh, was pretty vociferous and the, the catholics were rather subdued i remember what goes on in northern ireland now was going on in manchester in my youth you know you call, the catholics uh, called us uh, the sorry the protestants called us catholics and we call them proddy dogs and we didn't really know what the uh, issue was, it was rather like dealing with two different races, and I suppose the association of the, with the Catholics was Irish, we were supposed to be Irish. That may be a good thing for a writer to have in his childhood, that, that, that sense of, of division, and make you look more critically at the world. I agree with you, I think, I think it shows you what the, what the human predicament is. Mm. Uh, we're a long time getting towards this notion of universality, that mm. we're all human beings.
Uh, indeed, we're worse off than ever we were, but we won't go into the whooshty business, I hope, for oh. the moment. Tell me about your, about, the, about your childhood. Did you ever know your mother? No. Uh, at the end of the First World War, there was this tremendous pandemic, the or epidemic uh, of influenza. I think it was the sheer vindictiveness of whatever god there be or was uh, in uh, imposing this uh, ghastly epidemic on, on a world that had already suffered enough uh, from the war that uh, lately made me feel that... Uh, Religion was rather dangerous. I'd rather not believe in God. The, um, the fact was that my mother and uh, sister died within days of each other, which was a fairly common occurrence then. My uh, father, I think, rather resented me because I was still alive, he, somebody he didn't know, and whereas these two he did know and loved uh, had died. And uh, this, of course, applies to quite a number of people. Who brought you up? I was brought up by an aunt, uh, Protestant aunt, strangely enough, uh, who had two daughters of her own, who was a, who was a bad cook, and... Uh, uh, not very sympathetic, and eventually my father married an Irish woman who kept a pub. So I was brought up in a pub. Noisy pub? A very noisy pub, one of these old pubs which no longer exist. Uh, it always amazes me that uh, the poor of those days could always find money to drink. The, uh, the drinking, the drunkenness was excessive. Whether this was a good thing, I'm not quite sure. Didn't put you off it, though, did it? Not really, no. I, I recognise this again was part of the human condition, uh, getting drunk. But um, being, being brought up in a slum district, uh, as I was, uh, I suppose, again, was not a bad thing. It was probably better than being brought up in a rather sedate suburb. I, I felt, uh, when I joined the army, for example, that uh, I knew these people. I knew these Glasgow toughs. I knew them all already. Did you learn, you think, early to fend for yourself? I'm not be very good at that. I'm, uh, I suppose, rather cowardly, like most people. Uh, I think that uh, I did... Uh, gain a kind of uh, strain of uh, fairly tough independence and a little cynicism, a certain ironic approach to life. Uh, I've never expected too much from life. I've never expected too much from other people. I think this is wise. Uh, my son is different. He's uh, outgoing, affectionate, and has been let down so often that uh, I realize that uh, this vulnerability is the, is the worst thing, is the worst possible thing you can have. But you were protected from that. Can you still smell the smells and hear the sounds and songs and, and ribaldry of, of that Manchester childhood? Indeed, I can. I, I'm sorry, in many ways, it's gone. You see, my, my mother, whom I, I never knew, uh, had been a dancer and singer in the uh, music hall. Uh, my father was uh, a pianist in the music hall and eventually a cinema pianist. I'm very proud of the fact that he played once for the eight Lancashire lads, who included Charlie Chaplin and uh, Stan Laurel, Stan Jefferson in those days. Uh, this was a great tradition which has disappeared. We're a little too sedate, mechanised. Uh, I look back with a, a nostalgia, a sort of factitious nostalgia, because, because I was not there oh. until this age. Of course, J.B. Priestley was doing it, you know, always writing about it. But the you're age. actually saying that you felt there was a, there was a, the family was an entertaining family. There was something was. of that Indeed in it. Indeed it was. Yeah. I think the, the, the old tradition of... Uh, well, everybody played the piano, everybody sang oh. songs. Uh, there was a certain life in the streets. Uh, perhaps we were all ill, undernourished, poverty-stricken, but uh, the, uh, this notion, it came up, I think, with uh, Somerset Maugham, whose uh, new biography I've been reading, who was still at this nostalgia. He wrote Liza of Lambeth, which was about this impoverished East End, but still it was uh, more alive, more vital than anything that came after. Getting an education must have lifted you out of that working-class background a bit, or lower-middle-class background. Well, I think that uh, the Catholics in uh, England, of course, have always had trouble with education. The, the Catholics were not allowed uh, university education until 1829 with the Catholic Emancipation Act. And, uh, of course, there was no tradition in any Catholic family up north of getting an education. If there was talent, you went on the stage, like the Beatles, like George Formby and the rest. Uh, I, with some difficulty, managed to get an education. With some difficulty, I had to work for a couple of years, save money, and get to the university. Uh, this, in a sense, did cut me off from that tradition. I was in a kind of literary ambience. I was more concerned with the music of Wagner and Debussy and so on than the music my father had played. So I'm well aware of this uh, danger of education. You cut yourself off. Catholicism was a very powerful influence on you, was it, as a child? I think it, yes, it was. Uh, this, uh, it was a, a kind of northwestern Catholicism. It was uh, conceivably Anglo-Saxon. You know, it was Anglo-Saxon Catholicism that had not been touched by the Reformation, but it had to be reinforced by marriage into Ireland and by uh, having Irish priests, Irish bishops and so forth. 
Uh, but, uh, yes, it meant a great deal to me when I was young. The, uh, I believed in hell. I, I believed that the, the host was really the body and blood of Christ. I, I accept what the priest said. And this fear of hell uh, still, uh, still persists. Still it, persists it, it, it in you. The, I, have no, I have no means of proving it does not exist. Right. And I gather our present pope, well, I know that our present pope, uh, John Paul II, uh, before he goes off to Castel Gandolfo for the summer, usually comes out with some minor bombshells such as hell still exists, don't forget that. It are probably you, does. Are you a believing Catholic? No, I, I don't think I am. But I don't know what the term means, you see, because if you're, if uh, for several generations or indeed centuries the, the, the uh, religion has been instilled into a family, it's, it's, part of, it's in your bloodstream. Yeah. It's very hard to get rid of. You're not a practicing Catholic? Mm, well, when I go to Italy, I, I meet some, a few priests whom I admire and like, and uh, I go to their little Renaissance churches to hear Mass in you Italian. Hear? In you hear mass? To hear mass, yes. well, to, to participate. Do you go to confession? No, no longer. No, this is bad, I suppose. One should go to confession, but I don't know. I don't think I can. I think that uh, I'm probably right in uh, being a little scared of all organized religion now. Why do you call your, I think, marvelous autobiography Confe Thank you. Confessions? Why do you call that The Confessions? Well, I, exactly. That's a, very, uh, that's a very shrewd point to make. Uh, I am, in fact, confessing. This is... Uh, a kind of literary equivalent of going into the confessional and uh, saying, you know, blessed be Father, I have sinned, uh, off we go. Uh, I think it's one of but Graham Greene's characters. Can, you get, can <laughs> you get absolution from the general public? Uh, probably not, uh, not from a Protestant general public. Uh, I've had uh, odd letters absolving me from the crimes I present in the book. Uh, I don't know, I think the, I think the confessional tradition in uh, literature, as well as in Religious life is probably a good thing. We, we burden our, our minds with past sins, uh, regrets, all kinds of uh, inhibiting forces. It's probably best to get them out occasionally. The confessional is probably a very good institution. Nowadays we have the psychoanalyst, which costs more. Do you still feel guilty? Oh, yes. Guilty as hell. Yeah. What, uh, about? what about? I don't know. Uh, the, the fact that I don't know what I'm guilty of, probably for not treating people well, not treating my wife well and so forth, I'm not seeing other people well, but I think the uh, I'm inclined to get back to the old uh, Judeo-Christian um, doctrine of original sin, which seems to me to explain the guilt. We're born with something guilty in us, which right. then uh, finds uh, rationale, you know, in Auschwitz or what you will. The guilt is there, waiting for a, a subject to, uh, as it were, justify it. Do you accept, I um, mean, does that help you to an understanding of other people's guilt, as it were? I think it does. It, uh, it, it also means that uh, one is never really surprised uh, right. what happens. One was terribly surprised. Betrayed, ever? Betrayed. I think we're always betrayed. We must always uh, expect betrayal at some time or another. One must not expect too much. Were uh, you... This, uh, but uh, this is because one, uh, the guilt in oneself uh, does relate to the imperfections in oneself which are part of the human condition. In the, in the autobiography, there's mm. a, a, a very frank account of uh, your relationship with your first wife. Yes, indeed. Were you more hurt by that, in, in fact, than you let on in the book, or not? I suppose, uh, yes, I think you're right. I think one way of, uh, as it were, uh, shedding, uh, shedding the sense of betrayal was to get it on paper, where it becomes something else. On the other hand, uh, we're all free. My first wife was Protestant Welsh. Uh, the Welsh, I think, on the whole, are more sexually given than the other Celts. I mean, the Irish drink, the Scots drink. They're not a very sexually-minded race, either of them. But the Welsh are given to that. My first wife honestly believed that uh, uh, free, uh, indiscriminate sexual congress was not a bad thing, mm. uh, because this uh, prevented one from uh, identifying with love. She said love was a different thing altogether. She may have been right, but as uh, we know, it's when we see, when we see, then the knife comes out. We can't, we can't quite eat, we can't so easily uh, overcome our primitive instincts. Uh, yes, there is a certain measure of uh, sense of hurt, betrayal, but uh, uh, this is all over now. You say somewhere that um, one of the reasons you live in Monaco mm -hmm. is that it's a Catholic place and that there's a sense of homing about it. Is that serious? It's one of the reasons. I, when I married again, I married into, into Europe. Uh, yes, there's a certain sense in which that is true, that if one hears the Angelus Bell at 12 and sees people occasionally making the sign of the cross, you feel you're home. Uh, I've never had much, uh, well, much pleasure in, in uh, traveling to the Protestant south of this country. I feel that London is a, an alien city in some ways, a Protestant city, with a Protestant monarch. Try Kilburn. 
Well, well, I know. But uh, Monte Carlo seems to some of us a sort of camp for rich, displaced persons. Marco. Uh, yes, rather uh, than a home. Is that not? There's not something in that. Uh, there's a lot of exiles there. <clears throat> yes, a great number of exiles. On the other hand, it is a it is a genuine Catholic principality, uh, where uh, I feel a little at home. Unfortunately, what you say is true. There are too many uh, exiles from Milan. They need from England people with money. I gather there's uh, one policeman to every five inhabitants. That's to protect wealth. I'm not wealthy, being a writer. But uh, one has to live somewhere, and uh, to go into the reasons why I'm there would take too long. But the fact is, I was living in Italy with my wife and uh, our son, and our son was going to be kidnapped. I was told this by an ex-mafioso, and uh, so we got into the car and ran to the next state, which happens to be Monaco. Simple as that. The, um, you said Europe, Europe and mm. uh, you have a great sort of sense of Europe. Yes, I think so, yes and try to bring that into your books? I think so. Of course, we're all going to be Europeans. We're already supposed to be Europeans. We're all going to be very genuinely Europeans. I don't think the English are ready for it. Do British. you feel that more than feeling English? <sighs> yes, I think that must be so, because uh, my family was never part of the Reformation. We never had any part in the English Reformation. We had no part in Henry VIII's church. And indeed, when, uh, when James II was driven out of England, uh, uh, we lost our last... Catholic monarch. My father always said to me, son, he said, don't give allegiance to any monarch, a Hanoverian Protestant. Your last monarch was James II. Uh, this ran in the family, and it may seem romantic and stupid. Ober and war would certainly say so, but I can assure you it's genuine. What do you enjoy about living in Monte Carlo? Uh, not very much. I, uh, well, I enjoy, um, what do I enjoy? I enjoy going to the casino. I enjoy uh, seeing the valley. I enjoy breathing in the polluted Mediterranean. But uh, the principality itself is becoming full of skyscrapers. It's becoming a commercial center. It's becoming, as you suggest, a, a bold hole for people. Do you, feel Eng Do you feel English still? Oh, yes. I think the more one lives abroad, uh, the more one tends to emphasize one's Britishry or Englishry. Uh, I come back to England for very small things, like um, English sausages, English cheese, English beer, pubs, and the like. Might you come back and live here? to die here, undoubtedly. I suppose the time is coming to think about that. And uh, my family is buried up in Manchester, Moston Cemetery. I might be ready there. Uh, I don't know. This, but this is a problem that faces one in one's seventies. One, obviously, by any actuarial standards, has not long to live. So one, I'd better start thinking about that. Wasn't it Jung who said it's stupid, it's neurotic to avoid the subject of death in old age? I think he was right. Do you think about death a lot? A good deal, yes, a good deal. Every day? Uh, every morning, yes. I think, I think uh, one has uh, stupid ideas. I, I feel sorry for my heart. My heart has been beating for 72 years about a break, about a rest. It seems unfair to a heart. I mentioned this to a doctor who said, don't worry about your heart. Your heart likes doing that. But in the pr press release about any old iron, mm. you actually tell us that your heart is thumping away quite merrily. It's thumping away, certainly. <laughs> and you tell us that your sex life is still going strong. Uh, strong enough, yes. Uh, not so strong as uh, that of younger people, but uh, I think the sexual instinct is uh, very slow to be killed. In your three the novels that you wrote when you were in the colonial service, yes. in, in uh, Malaya, mm -hmm. um, there's a very particular sense of being in a particular place at a particular time. Mm -hmm. um, has that gone from your writing with this search for a, a wider scope? Hard to say. I must leave that to you and the critics. But uh, I, indeed, uh, you're right to to mention this beginning because uh, uh, I had a very strong feeling when I began to write and publish fiction that uh, uh, here was a place uh, which was going to disappear from the British consciousness before long, namely Malaya, Malaysia, and it had to be written about. And I suppose there was a kind of deliberate attempt to encase the atmosphere of the place in fiction. It, I knew it had been done by Willie Maugham, by William Somerset Maugham already, but uh, good as he is, as, he is and, uh, as much as he's recognised as you know, the real uh, fictional authority on Malaya, he, he never knew the people, he never knew the language. It's, I did, and I was able to write from the inside. Was, was writing that sort of novel a different sort of activity from writing the, the grand, mm -hmm. ambitious novels of your more recent work? I suppose one can say that, uh, I, I suppose every novelist feels, that, every young novelist feels that, that it's great fun. Uh, the, the writing of fiction is great fun at first because you're inventing characters, you're manipulating them, sense of power, uh, a sense of delight in manipulating language too. But as time goes on and when one has, you know, 
compose one's 30th novel, one realizes that one has been playing with fire all the way along. It's a very difficult form, a very difficult art form indeed, and the, the disciplines, the techniques involved are, are tremendously difficult. But are you now deliberately choosing to subsume great areas of subject matter into a new book? I mean, the, the, any old iron has yes. a vast scope, both in yes, time but, and in place. Yes, but of course, it, it doesn't deal with the present, unfortunately, except by implication. Mm. It, it, uh, I think the thing finishes in the 50s. There's a great danger, I think, in my own case, that uh, living abroad, as I do, uh, and I, I may instance James Joyce uh, for a higher level, uh, Joyce was not able to write about the Dublin of, say, 1922. He had to write about the Dublin of 1904. I think I must... Uh, hide myself away in some London suburb and uh, get around, listen to the speech, read the papers, and attempt to do what a novelist should do, namely deal with his own time. I mean, you're saying that that's not what you've been doing recently? I don't think I've been doing that recently, but I don't think perhaps it matters a great deal. Right. Dickens didn't deal with his own, right. his own time. He dealt with, you know, about 50 years back. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but on the other hand, one possibly has a duty to... Uh, explain uh, to one's, you know, contemporaries, one's younger contemporaries especially, what the world is they're living in. Yeah. And uh, the Thatcherian world is a reality and I haven't touched it. So there will be more novels? If I live, yes. It's my trade. <laughs> when you returned from the East, you were mm. told that you wouldn't live, that you Indeed would I die. Was, yes, yes. Did you believe it? No, I don't think anybody does. Uh, I, uh, looking back now, I see that um, the... Uh, I was driven out of the colonial service, I think possibly for political reasons that were disguised as clinical reasons. Uh, my poor first wife was told that uh, I had a, an inoperable uh, cerebral tumour and they gave me to cover themselves a year to live. Uh, she tried to keep the secret but could not and eventually divulged it to me. I didn't feel too bad about it. I felt it was not true. In any case, I'd been given a year. Nobody, I've not been given a year since. But you sat down and you didn't do I sat reach down, for the I bottle. Sat, you sat down and started to write. I sat down. I sat down with a sense of uh, duty to my uh, my prospective widow and uh, tried to make little money. It was very difficult. You could never make much money with writing to uh, fulfil what talent I had and uh, produce the, the works I did. Uh, it can be done if you write two thousand words before breakfast. You've got the rest of the day to yourself. And I did, in fact, produce uh, very nearly six novels in that year. Uh, this, of course, didn't earn, di di didn't earn admiration. This earned resentment and uh, sneers. You know, have you written your monthly novel yet, Virgil? That kind of thing. Do you still write so fast? No, no. But I think that nobody can write without uh, discipline. You can't say, oh, let's wait for the inspiration to come. It doesn't come. It doesn't work. Right. So do you sit down at a desk every morning? Yes, sit down at the desk. Every single morning? Every single morning, including weekends, yes. This morning? Oh, this morning I'm in London. I'm on a sort of holiday. I'm with you. I mean, uh, this is not a working day. Do you rework what you've written? Do you go back over it? I don't rework it. I, uh, this, uh, the, the, the way I write uh, has much to do with the way I, I write music. You see, the, look at it this way, uh, a very simple way of looking at it. The music paper, uh, especially <coughs> scoring paper, is very expensive. Uh, you can't afford to spoil anything. You'd better get it sorted out in your head, in your ear, in your inner ear, before you get it on paper, like Sibelius. You know, Sibelius heard the whole symphony and then wrote it down without uh, making any changes. Uh, I like to get a page uh, organised. And the book, ac Acceptable, you... and then the right. next page, and the right. next page, and right. so on. And do you think the whole book through before you... Before I don't you... think anybody can. I think mm. one um, can roughly proceed up to a point. I think, wasn't it E.M. Forster who said that in uh, Passage to India, he was he got it as far as the Malabar Caves, but not further. And Joyce said, you know, don't work too much at... Um, thinking what the characters are going to do. They'll take over. Some people say that when the characters and the story are humming along, mm -hmm. you can't resist the temptation to, to show off a bit, to put in wordplay, to tell us about language. I to, don't know why uh, people say, is, call this showing off. I, I, I should imagine it was... Uh, does Rabelais... Does Shakespeare show off? Does Shakespeare show off? Uh, Shakespeare's always introducing mm -hmm. uh, strange words like orgulous. They kissed away kingdom. That's very, a very daring thing to say. But uh, rates me the mm. somehow the Antony Clipart is a, is a show-off play, if you like. But mm. I don't feel that. I don't feel that at all about my own work. I think that uh, our Shakespeare's our great model always. I mean, he's the man we should read, learn from, and he was a tremendous player with words. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it. But they're there for our entertainment, or because they're utterly germane to the stuff. I of think a it's uh, book? possibly an unworthy uh, feeling, an unworthy conviction that. In uh, fiction, or in any kind of verbal art, uh, words should be one of the characters. Sh words should be characters. Uh, language should be a character in itself. 
Uh, I'm not uh, suggesting that what I write is superior. God forbid to say what Freddie Forsyth writes, but it's two different ways of writing. Uh, Freddie Forsyth gives you a transparent language. You can look through it and get at the action itself. Whereas with me, the language is a bit more opaque. It's just the way we are. Is autobiography a sort of fiction? You talk as oh, if yes. you're... Mm. Oh, yes, I think so. <laughs> one manipulates the past to some extent. Uh, the past just doesn't just flow over one. It, uh, one does make the past to some extent. How different will the second volume of your autobiography well, be from the first one? The second volume is written, is completed, but uh, it has not yet been published. The second volume will deal with the most painful part of my life, the, uh, the part of the, my life in which I was trying to earn a living as a writer with great difficulty, in which my first wife was gradually succumbing to the fatal disease of cirrhosis, uh, the period of her death, and then my final resurrection, rehabilitation, and life with my second wife. It ends happily, I think. Are you writing any music these days? All the time, but of course it's never heard in this country, never heard in England. The, the music is played uh, abroad quite a number of times. I think there's some idea in this country that you can't be uh, both a writer and, and a composer. But uh, if I may boast, in this last six months I've had a symphony performed in Strasbourg, uh, a work for orchestra performed in Geneva, a setting of a poem by Denunzio performed in uh, Amsterdam and Spotorno in Italy, and only last Saturday uh, a concerto for guitar and uh, four guitars and orchestra performed in Cannes, and a symphony performed in Strasbourg. What sort of music do you write? It is, post, it is what they call post-tonal. Uh, it uses uh, a regular orchestra, uh, regular bar lines. It, the, the rhythms are mm, irregular. The, uh, it, is not, uh, it is not Pierre Boulez, quite. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, avoid melody. Uh, it uh, is, I think, occasionally euphonious. Uh, it, it, it is well structured. Are you more proud of that than of the writing? Well, consider, you see, uh, sitting in uh, a concert hall in Cannes, the, the Salle du Bussy in, uh, in uh, Cannes last week, uh, with an audience, say, of a thousand, uh, listening to my work. You could watch their faces. You're getting a response. And at the end, you get applause. You don't get that with a novel. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have said, uh, looking back at your work, that this society... Uh, critics and public haven't mm. accorded you the recognition that you really deserve, that we don't treat you as a great man living in our midst, which we ought to do. Do you feel that? Oh, God forbid. I never feel myself great. I, uh, I, I, I fi I'm a little worried, I suppose, at the fact that uh, when I produce a book, there, there's a tendency on the part of critics to uh, have a bit of a laugh, you know. Uh, Burgess is too prolific. Uh, too prolific? God said, no, go, for, go forth and multiply. Um, uh, as for honours, no, I don't get those. Uh, I don't expect... I get them from other countries, but not here. It's rather embarrassing. Monsieur Mitterrand uh, gave me, made me a commandeur des arts des lettres. I had to apply to Mrs. Thatcher for permission to accept this. Uh, but Mrs. Thatcher didn't say, oh, so sorry, you know, we'll give you the same while we're at it. You, no, said, it matter. you said earlier in this that you were still hoping to write something which put the whole of yourself into a mm -hmm. fiction in a way that you hadn't yet achieved. Yes. Is there a, a hole, without a W, a hole, think, a hole in your work that's uh -huh. yet to be filled? I don't. I think we're, I think we're pretty well fragmented, you know, all of us. I, I think it's impossible to see oneself as a whole. Uh, I think only what, all one can do is, is to create characters, or try to create characters uh, that represent some part of oneself. One can never create a single character that contains the whole of oneself. I don't know, you'd think even Shakespeare could do that. Uh, characters are always fragments of the uh, personality of the creator. Is Hamlet Shakespeare? Yes. So is Anthony. If, if, little, if little Wilson bumped mm. into Big Burgess yeah. in front of us now, what would he say to him? Oh, i say, you know, come off it. Or oh, what has already been said to me in Manchester is turned, up in, is turned into a, a stuck-up, opinionated bastard. Because that's the Mancunian response to anybody who's left the city and tried to achieve something in the bigger world.